Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the nitrate removal denitrification for groundwater webinar. My name is Damien Tonell, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. I am a project manager for Wilson Engineers and a member of the AZ Water Association's Water Treatment Committee. If you are interested in becoming a member or joining a committee, please visit the AZ Water Association's homepage at www.azwater.org. You can click on the committee's link at the top of the homepage and then select the committees that you find of interest. Before we begin the webinar, I just have a few housekeeping notes. Um, if you uh, have questions for the speakers during those presentations, you just need to uh, type them in into the question chat window on your GoToWebinar control panel. And at the end of each presentation, we will have um, a short question and answer session. So you can ask your questions uh, during the presentation. Um, two professional development hours are being awarded for this webinar. And a PDH certificate for this webinar will be emailed to you after the webinar as a PDF file. Today, our webinar will focus on the biological treatment of nitrate found in, drink, in drinking groundwater. As most of you already know, nitrate is an acute contaminant that can cause serious health issues and is fairly common here in the southwestern U.S. Most technologies used to reduce nitrate concentrations today involve some type of um, ion exchange system. These are proven technologies, but they all tend to have the same drawback, which is a high TDS brine discharged with elevated nitrate levels. Finding discharge locations for the high salinity brine is becoming more difficult and expensive. As a result, a lot of research has been done to eliminate this issue, and today several technologies based on biological treatment are emerging with already some permitted systems operating in the U.S. The biological treatment processes utilize microorganisms to naturally break down nitrate to harmless nitrogen gas and oxygen. The treatment processes do not create a high salinity brine solution, making these technologies more sustainable. And uh, the most prominent biological treatment processes for groundwater available on the market today are denitrovy and biota, which will be the focus of this webinar. Both processes have ongoing pilot testing at the Santiago Trail site in Casa Grande and have been featured in a few tours organized by AZ Water during the last couple of months. During those tours, the two presenters of this webinar, Ali Dory and Doug Craver, got the opportunity to present their product firsthand to the AZ Water community. And I must say, being part of one of the tours myself, I must uh, say that this was a very interesting uh, topic, and I hope you will all enjoy learning about these systems as much as I did. Without further ado, we will begin our first presentation called A New and Innovative Approach to Drinking Water Nitrate Removal. The presenter is Ali Dory of Micro, of Micro V Biotechnologies. Ali has over 12 years of experience in water and wastewater and joined Micro V to commercialize and scale several of Micro V's technologies. He overlooks Micro V's water and wastewater technologies and projects in North America. He has been actively conducting workshops and presenting nitrate treatment solutions uh, both in California and internationally. Ali is the Director of Business Development and Product Manager for Microv's Nitro-V product line. Now, Ali, I think you're on and you can share, start sharing your screen. Uh, Ali, are you here? Hello. Hi, Damien. Um, hey. Can you hear me okay? I hear you fine. So I think everybody can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, so we'll let you start uh, your presentation. Sure. Thanks again for the introduction. And uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank everyone um, for participating um, and taking the time to listen to the, this process. Um, so um, just a quick presentation outline. Um, I'll quickly touch on the nitrate market um, as well as the treatment technologies that are available to us today. Um, I will then dive into the microbi solution and how we differ from um, other uh, biological processes 
And I will also highlight um, the, our full-scale system that is currently in operation um, at a water company in Pasadena, California. And as Damien mentioned, we will have some time for questions towards the end of the presentation. Without further ado, um, nitrate uh, impacts um, both the United States, specifically the Southwest and the Midwest areas, um, as well as globally. So nitrate, um, I've had the opportunity to uh, participate in conferences in Europe, in the Middle East, and in Australia. And nitrate contamination in groundwater is um, a problem that we're dealing with both here domestically and internationally. Um, as Damien mentioned, it is a, an acute um, uh, contaminant. And so uh, regulatory agencies and, and health departments take nitrate contamination very seriously. Um, it, it being an acute contamination, um, drinking just one glass of, of water that has nitrate over the MCL can have some health impacts. What's been interesting about nitrate contamination is there has been a lot of studies that have come out uh, recently from the National Cancer Institute that have indicated that nitrate uh, concentrations over five milligrams per liter, if consumed over a long-term period, can be cancer-causing, um, specifically to the colon and, and the bladder. Currently, the MCL is 10 milligrams per liter. Um, if we focus in on the United States, you'll see that there's some, some large bodies of water and basins that have um, issues with nitrate contamination. Um, and particularly in the state of Arizona, there has been a um, big population increase um, uh, due to the drought water has become more of, um, uh, uh, of an important topic and in conservation of water and, and coming up with more environmentally friendly ways of, of treating contaminants in water. As you can see on the graph on the left-hand side, um, there is a high probability, 80% of, of nitrate uh, groundwater contamination in, in the state of Arizona um, currently has the potential to exceed five milligrams per liter, which is half the MCL. And so nitrate is an issue that has been ongoing over the years um, due to dropping groundwater uh, levels and, and increases in population. Um, nitrate levels across the country have continued to rise, and, and more and more people are looking at um, implementing nitrate treatment technologies at well sites. When you look at the treatment landscape, the predominant treatment method that has been used to date in the United States um, it isn't necessarily a treatment technology, but it's the concept of blending. Um, a lot of um, utilities and water companies have taken water that has high nitrate contamination, and they have found other water sources to blend these nitrates down to get it below the MCL. More and more, um, due to population growth, dropping groundwater levels, there has been an emphasis to uh, treat those nitrates rather than, than, than pumping water from other locations to blend these um, nitrates down. And so um, the predominant nitrate, and so when you, when you look at treatment technologies um, that are available to us outside of blending, we classify them into two basic categories. You've got nitrate removal technologies and nitrate reduction technologies. And as similar as these sound, fundamentally they're very different. Nitrate removal technologies refer to physical and chemical processes, which have been uh, ion exchange and reverse osmosis. And the reason we classify these as nitrate removal technologies is that these two processes, even though they're the, the common technologies that are used today, don't actually reduce or destroy nitrate. They take a large body of water that has nitrate contamination, it goes through an ion exchange or a reverse osmosis process, and the nitrate is then concentrated into a brine or a reject stream that then gets transferred onto a disposal facility or a wastewater treatment plant. And so they're not actually reducing or destroying nitrate, but rather concentrating it and passing it back uh, down on. Now, I mentioned that ion exchange has probably been the most predominant technology that, that has been used in the United States for nitrate treatment. Um, there has been issues with the brine. Uh, so ion exchange produces a brine stream um, that has TDS levels that are 70, 80,000 milligrams per liter. Over the years, um, wastewater treatment plants uh, would take that brine stream. Um, in certain states, you're able to discharge that brine into surface water. And um, due to the high TDS and the high chloride concentration of brine, uh, more and more wastewater treatment plants are not um, taking that brine stream anymore. And, and um, uh, plants that have had ion exchange 
um, have had to haul that brine off-site, and it's become a very costly uh, and operator-intensive um, uh, treatment process. Reverse osmosis, on the other hand, um, uh, the downside with reverse osmosis is that it still concentrates it into a, what we call a reject stream. It's not as concentrated as what you would see in an ion exchange brine, but the issue with, with reverse osmosis is you get really low water recovery. So typically for every 100 gallons of water that goes through an RO system, you lose about 30 or 20 to 30 gallons of that water through the RO process. And that loss of water has big financial and economic impacts um, for these water companies. Therefore, in, in recent years, um, uh, specifically in California, um, the state began investing a lot of dollars into looking at nitrate reduction technologies. And nitrate reduction technologies um, are most commonly referred to as biological denitrification processes. And what's interesting about biological denitrification is that although it is somewhat new in the water industry, we've been using it um, very uh, frequently on the, on the wastewater side. So the concept of using organisms and biology to convert nitrate to nitrogen gas um, has been used on the wastewater side, but has not crossed paths and been used on, on the water side. And I, I'll kind of highlight the reasons for that. So nitrate reduction technologies, what a biological process does is um, the organisms take a carbon source or an electron donor, typically in the form of, on the drinking water side, acetic acid. They take that and nitrate, and they convert that nitrate. They kind of digest it and consume it into nitrogen gas and, um, and, and water. And so these, the biological process actually has the unique capability of reducing or destroying nitrate rather than concentrating it and passing it um, uh, down and onto the next person. So there has been a lot of work that's been done in the state of California looking at nitrate reduction technology, specifically biological processes. Um, and I'll, I'll highlight further on the steps that we had to go through in order to get this um, certified to be used for drinking water. Um, this slide highlights some of the issues that we have with, with uh, physical and chemical processes. Um, as I mentioned, physical and chemical processes have secondary waste streams that we've got to deal with that are, that are hazardous. Um, physical processes such as RO are very high energy output and the cost of energy continues to rise. And so more and more people are looking at biological processes. Now, the issue that, that conventional biological processes have had to date is there is a fear of using organisms or microbiology in a drinking water system. Um, now you're dealing with a living organism. Um, you're, these living organisms grow and they die off, so they produce sludge. And the reaction rates have historically been much longer than what you would see in a physical or chemical process. So some of the big disadvantages have been you're dealing, dealing with the living organism. What happens if that organism dies off? You end up losing treatment, and a lot of water treatment plants can't afford to do that. The organisms grow and they die off, um, and that produces a, a biomass or sludge that then needs to be dealt with. Wastewater treatment plants have been equipped to take on that, and, and they're comfortable handling those solids. But on the water side, that's a very... Uh, uncomfortable position to be put in to be handling biomass and sludge. And the other thing is footprint. Um, footprint have, have all been larger. And so all of these have led to um, high life cycle costs and, and hesitation in using biological processes for nitrate removal in drinking water. This is a very unique quote that I like to use. It's, it's by an individual named Dr. Alicia Jackson, who's the deputy director of DARPA. DARPA is a, an arm of the Department of, of Energy um, and the Department of Defense, and they drive a lot of research dollars that go into universities and private institutions in developing the latest and the greatest technologies. And the quote goes, biology is the most ancient, and the most powerful technology that we know of. It could do things that no other man-made uh, machine or synthetic chemistry can even begin to approach in terms of materials it can create and the functions that it can do. And the reason this is important is when you look at using biology or synthetic biology, whether it's water, wastewater treatment, um, military, food, uh, pharmaceutical, there has been a big influx in the federal government investing research dollars and improving biological processes because of this unique power or capability that it has in, 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 in the matter that it can create things that man-made 
um, materials or processes can't um, can't really do. And so um, they really this group really sets um, where research is headed in the next five, 10, 15 years. Uh, Microbi has been fortunate enough to secure over ten million dollars in federal funding to develop its technology, both from the National Institute of Health and the National Science Foundation. And so um, they, the government has been very supportive and continued promoting biological processes for these various industries. As I mentioned, there's been fundamental challenges with biological processes, um, and it all comes back down to the, the fundamental um, paradigm in which we have approached biological processes. We've been using biological processes on the, on the wastewater side for over 100 years now. And the fundamental concept has always been water comes in, we give it some air, we give it some food, we grow this mixed population of organisms. These organisms grow, they eventually die off, and then we've got to remove them. And we go through this constant cycle of growing and removing, growing and removing. And we've never really looked at um, any other approaches. Over the past 100 years, there has been a lot of improvements, um, such as being able to retain a certain population of biological organisms inside of a reactor or a basin. We've understood the macro environment, so now we've got a really good understanding on um, the dissolved oxygen that needs to be maintained, the pH, the temperature. But we've never shifted away from this concept of you know, this cycle of growing and removing organisms. And this concept of growing and removing has led to processes becoming unreliable. We don't really have any control over the biological process. It's very in intensive. It's wasteful in, in the amount of solids and biomass that's being produced. And it, at the end of the day, it's become a costly process. Biology is capable of producing a lot of contaminants, but it's always been the pre and the post treatment that's kind of um, not allowed it to, to play a role, in, especially in the drinking water space, where you've got to meet very distinct. Uh, water quality parameters. And so, uh, Microbi, we were first, the, the, the hypothesis um, that Microbi dealt with initially was our core competency has always been material science and microbiology. And the fundamental question for us was why is it that we have identified and found organisms that have lived in soil on this earth for millions of years without us babysitting them? and taking care of them. But as soon as we take these organisms and we put them inside of our basins and our reactors, they die off. And we then go through the cycle of growing and removing organisms. There has got to be a fundamental disconnect between what's happening in nature and what's happening in, in, our, in our biological reactors. And so what we do is um, we coin the term called micro niche engineering, where we focus on using material science to um, replicate and, and um, mimic an organism's natural habitat, um, in a sense, in a, in a, in a biological process. And, and an example is, for example, for denitrification or nitrate removal, we identify a single organism that's not genetically modified, it's a natural organism that's found in soil. And what we do is we, we design a structure that mimics that organism's in, environment in soil and allows it to thrive and allows it to work on a community level. And so what we do is we take that single strain organism, we send it to a fermentation process where they, what they do is they mass produce these organisms at a very large scale. We then take that single organism and we take it through a manufacturing process where the organism becomes entrapped on the inside of what we call a biocatalyst. And the biocatalyst is a synthetic structure that's extremely porous. Its, its size is about three to five millimeters in diameter, but the organisms are trapped on the inside and are physically not allowed to escape from these biocatalysts. Water and nutrients will travel in and come in contact with the organism, and, and, and gases and then water can travel out without the organism actually escaping uh, these biocatalysts. So as an example, if you look at a conventional biological process, you've got this big reactor, water comes in, we add some food, we add some air, we grow this mixed population of organisms, we run all these organisms in a, in a single environment, um, and we 
There are some organisms that remove nitrate. There's other organisms that don't. But we get this mixed population, and you go through this growing and removing cycle. Now, what we do is we, because we know we've got a single organism inside of these biocatalysts, we design a very efficient reactor. We, ha we take these biocatalysts and we put them inside of these reactors, and now we have a single species organisms that, and we have a very good understanding as to how it operates. We've created these microenvironments to allow the organism to thrive, and now you've got a very controlled biological process that can be used for nitrate removal. And so the way the process works is water comes in, we dose it with an, with an acetic acid, which is the carbon source, the electron donor. So acetic acid and nitrate goes into the reactor, diffuses into these biocatalysts. The organism take acetic acid and nitrate, convert to nitrogen to nitrogen gas, and gas goes up into the atmosphere. And you've got clean water with no nitrate leaving the process. So initially, um, we developed this process a couple years ago. And, um, and we decided to start in the state of California. Nitrate is, is very problematic in the state of California. And, and very similar to many water companies um, that are dealing with nitrate, Sunny Slope was dealing with um, high nitrate concentrations in two of their wells. And so what they were doing is they were importing water in and, and getting clean water delivered to them to blend those wells down. Um, and in order to get their nitrates low enough to be able to go into their distribution system. The issue they had was um, they were, they were, the, the cost of purchasing that water and delivering that water to their site was significant. Um, and it was, it was raising uh, the cost of, of, of water treatment significantly. And so when we approached Sunny Slope, the feedback was we don't have access to a brine line. So if you've got a process that's going to produce brine, um, forget about it because we're going to have to haul that off. And the cost in this area to haul off brine ranges from 30 cents to 40 cents per gallon of brine to haul off. On top of that, you've got to, to bring in one or two truckloads of salt to create this brine to regenerate the resin. So there's it's quite an intense process that takes place. And so they were looking for a cost-effective solution that does not produce a waste stream. And so we parted with Sunny Slope three years ago. Um, initially, we ran a small pilot study that was just a couple gallons per minute, and the purpose of this pilot was to show Sunny Slope Water Company that we can consistently remove nitrate and that we don't produce a waste stream. And the ease of operation, so we had their operators operate it. So after 90 days, Sunny Slope was convinced that this system did not produce any solids, it was converting nitrate to nitrogen gas, and it was very easy to operate. And so we partnered with Sunny Slope, as well as the Division of Drinking Water, and we ran a nine-month study um, looking at and demonstrating to the regulatory agency that we can remove nitrate cost-effectively, efficiently, and we're able to meet all of the drinking water standards, um, uh, as well as looking at various failure and shutdown scenarios. And so, and I'll highlight what went on in this demonstration process. But we looked at short, medium, and long-term shutdown periods from one hour to eight hour um, to two weeks. Um, we looked at how fast the system would respond if the chemical dose was, was shut down for short, medium, and, and long terms. Um, we looked at long-term uh, consistency. We did a lot of post-treatment sampling, um, which included disinfection byproducts, back T samples, um, nitrate, turbidity. So, there was a very complex and, and intensive protocol that was run in order to satisfy the regulatory agency within the state of California that this process not only removes nitrate, but has the ability to meet all of the drinking water standards. And so that led to the first full-scale system for Microbi um, in Pasadena at Sunny Slope. Um, and that currently that system's been running for about seven months now. And it takes a well that's got 1,400 gallons per minute pumping from it the nitrates are 10 to 12 milligrams per liter. We typically take a split stream, so 30 or 40% of that flow. It goes into our treatment system. We reduce the nitrates down to less than one, and then we re-blend it back in with that well. And so now they're able to operate that well and stand alone rather than import or get water, have to get water delivered into the system, into Sunny Slope, to blend those systems, uh, th that water down. So this is just a sample of 
some of that demonstration work that was done in the state of California. Um, as I mentioned, we did, a, we did a number of, of testing looking at steady state flow interruptions, chemical interruptions. There was a number of analytes that, was, that were looked at to make sure that the water that is being delivered um, to customers, even though we're using a biological process, is capable of meeting drinking water standards. Um, the process at, at Sunny Slope, um, uh, they have multiple contaminants. One of the contaminants that they're dealing with are VOCs. And so they upstream of our process, they've got a, a GAC process, an activated carbon process that removes their VOCs. And what we do is we take that split stream, it goes through the biological process. There's a process where we re-aerate the water. And the reason for that is, is, is the, the way the biological process works, it, it reduces the oxygen and then it removes the nitrate. So your, your reactor essentially is anoxic. And so you've got, um, uh, you, you, for taste and odor issues, it's best to re-aerate that water. So we re-aerate re that water back to a couple milligrams per liter. It then goes through some sort of a filtration process. In the state of California, um, even though we're uh, treating groundwater, they make us abide by surface water discharge requirements. So you, we've got a 0 0.3 NTU turbidity limit that we must meet. And so we've got a filtration step. And you could use disk filters, you could use an ultrafiltration process, you're able to use um, a pressure filter or a sand filter. So there's a lot of filtration options that are available out there. And then because this being it's the first system of its kind um, in Pasadena and at Sunny Slope, um, they wanted to treat our system as a standalone, so then we have a chlorine contact time where we disinfect and then send that water into, into Sunny Soap's reservoir. So that's what the, the process train looks like in the state of California. Now, when you look at other states, um, it's still unclear, for example, in Phoenix, if a filtration system is going to be required because um, whether the, the regulatory agency is going to need require a 0.3 NTU turbidity limit or a 1 NTU turbidity limit. If a 1 NTU limit is required, there's not going to be a need for a post-filtration step. Um, there will always be a need for a, a, a post-disinfection step, however. And so even though there was extensive testing done, um, and this will be the case um, in, in, in Arizona as well, is you, there's pilot systems, there's demonstrations, there's certain results that are generated from that, and that, that gives the agency and the client um, confidence that the system will work at full scale. Even when the full-scale system is, is online, you, now you've got to go through an intense process to, to ge and generate data to demonstrate that what you've accomplished at the pilot or a demonstration scale, you're able to meet that at full scale. So we did that uh, very same thing. The first 30 or 60, 90 days, we took very intense sampling to showcase that what was achieved in the pilot is also being achieved on the full-scale system. And, and all that was um, uh, done with uh, very satisfactory and um, we were awarded um, uh, essentially a license to be able to operate uh, this system and, and go into distribution. This is a picture of um, the biological process um, in, at, at Sunny Slope in Pasadena. Um, uh, you'll see two reactors there. Each one of these reactors has the ability to process anywhere from three to 500 gallons per minute. Um, we've we built this system as a showcase system. So there's in, inside the shipping container houses all of our online instrumentation, um, our control panels, and um, our strategy for developing these nitrate processes is, is we like to design, fully fabricate off um, uh, off site, and then bring everything on site and just kind of plug everything in, um, similar to a puzzle. So everything was manufactured off site, delivered, and um, the contractor was able to plug everything up um, and, and continue with the wet testing within three days. Um, this system has allowed Sunny Slope to, to save over 50% in operations. Um, and so it's been very both economically and technically attractive to them. It's been designed in a way to be able to handle higher nitrate concentrations um, as well as higher flow rates. And so it's got the ability to expand and be able to take on more load as they see increases um, and nitrate contamination across their, their well site. Um, as I mentioned, we partnered with, with uh, um, um, uh, engineering firms, uh, Civil Tech. Um, we work with the system integrators such as Intuitech, and we work closely with the regulatory agency to make sure that uh, we were successfully able to go through this process um, and get the system permitted and make sure that everyone has been comfortable with the results that are being generated 
and can and and um, comfortable with the process that's on site. Um, and so um, that kind of covers the the technology um, uh, where we are um, and uh, kind of where the industry is is headed in terms of of nitrate treatment. Um, and so I'll, I'll now I'll turn it over to Damien. Um, uh, and be more than happy to answer any questions that that uh, anyone has. Thank you, Ali. Uh, very interesting. Um, we um, there is one question from Ray um, who is asking. Uh, you can probably see it on your panel on the right too, Ali. But I'll read it to you. Uh, bacteria usually grow um, to maintain their colonies and life. Question is, does the filter media ever get bio? Uh, uh, fouled. Does it have some sort of solids handling? Sure, that's uh, that's a very good question. That's typically the number one question that I get. So, so very good question. Um, I, I didn't dive as much into the biology of it, but but the the concept of taking organisms and entrapping it inside of this this um, this biocatalyst. There's a couple things that take place. The first thing is is when I, um, as I mentioned, we, we send a, a strain and we run it through a fermentation process. And if you look at a, a growth curve of, of an organism, it goes through a very high growth phase and then it hits the phase um, that where we call it's a stationary phase. And if you take an organism that's in stationary phase, that organism is, um, is essentially um, non-growing or very slow growing, but it's a metabolically active very similar to human beings where at a young age we're very interested in replicating but then we hit an age where um, we just don't have kids anymore and so what we do is we take um, organisms that are in stationary phase they're very robust very established we then take those and we house it inside of these um, uh, biocatalysts and so uh, in a sense the biocatalyst uh, uh, that house these organisms there's a couple things that take place um, one is there's a physical restraint or, or constraint where the population is can't expand. There's just no more room to grow. And so what happens is when you're able to get um, organisms in a confined in my environment where there's physically no room to grow and they're working on a community level, there is a concept that's very well known that's called quorum sensing. And what happens is they create these channel signals and they be, begin commuting to each other that our population has reached its maximum and we, we can't replicate anymore. There's just physically, there's just no more room to grow. And so what happens is when you add your acetic acid or your carbon dose, there's a portion of that that goes to maintenance of the organism and the rest of it goes to degradation purposes. So if you look at conventional processes, there's a, a COD to N that's typically added or a carbon to nitrogen ratio that's added. And typically a portion of that goes to growth of organisms and another portion of that goes to um, degradation and so what we've been able to do is to only add enough carbon for maintenance and degradation um, the other thing that takes place is a lot of times these organisms they don't have infinite lives um, they're more robust they don't die as fast as, as um, maybe some younger organisms and so what happens is when these organisms die off and this doesn't take place over a period of hours or minutes or, or, or days, but over a period of months, there's a concept called cryptic growth or autophagy. And what happens is when you have a living cell next to a dead cell for a period of long time, it almost self cannibalizes that dead cell. And so you've got kind of a self regulating, self cleaning process that takes place inside of the biocatalyst. And so that's so, um, so we're able to control. To ascend and in a sense the, the biology inside of the biocatalyst. Now the question is is you're going to have indigenous organisms in groundwater that are naturally going to grow and um, and, and that, that is the case. So when I add my acetic acid or, or my carbon you're going to see some turbidity increase aco across the biological process. <coughs> Excuse me. However the way that this, the, the, chemi the, the, the chemical makeup of our biocatalyst designed in a way where it's not an attractive surface, both from a, a, a property perspective and a physical perspective, for organisms to want to attach themselves onto. So if you look at activated carbon or sand, it's got a very high surface area. It's got surface, certain surface um, uh, properties that make it very attractive for um, organisms to attach onto. That's not the case with, with, with the microbial biocatalyst. 
And the other thing we, 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 we do is we limit the amount of carbon that we add. Our systems are, um, I didn't mention this, but, but for nitrate, we use continuous third tank reactors. So you've got a reactor with these biocatalysts in there and you've got an overhead mixer that's constantly moving things around. So it doesn't give the opportunity for biofilms to really grow on the, the biocatalyst. And so many of the studies that we run today, we haven't had any issues with biofilm growing on the outside of the biocatalyst. There is a turbidity increase that we see across the reactor, but it's been very, very minimal. Um, and also to add to that, we're also running some tests um, in Arizona looking at taking chlorinated water through the microbial process and seeing how that system reacts. And if and in fact it is successful, we should see almost no turbidity increase um, and no biological growth um, uh, because that indigenous organism has essentially been destroyed by, by, by the chlorine. I see. Very well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just had a, um, there's, there's another question, but before we get to it, um, I just had a question about the dosage of acetic acid. What, what's the uh, typical dosage? Does it depend on the, on the water source? Yes. Yeah. So um, there's two parts to that. Um, uh, you, you, we typically dose acetic acid. You've got to compensate for the dissolved oxygen that's coming in as well as for the nitrate concentration that's coming in. So um, what we do is for every milligram per liter of dissolved oxygen, we need to dose one milligram per liter of COD. So if I've got eight milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen, we need to dose eight milligrams per liter of COD. Um, and for nitrate, there's a ratio that we use. And that ratio is typically for every um, uh, milligram per liter of nitrate as, as nitrogen, we need to dose anywhere from three to three and a half milligrams per liter of COD. Um, uh, when you look at conventional processes, that number is typically a lot higher because you need to add carbon for growth as well as for degradation purposes. Okay, all right. Um, talking about the, the food source, I also had another question. How do, uh, how do they do without any food? If you don't feed acetic acid for, for a while, do they just die or what, what's happening? So what happens with organisms, organisms have this unique ability to go into a dormant phase or kind of a hibernation type phase. Um, the systems, if you get a chance to visit uh, the, the system down in Casa Grande, um, those biocatalysts were manufactured five years ago for a project. Um, we ran a study three and a half years ago for nitrate and perchlorate. Um, that study ended about three years ago. The biocatalysts were stored in a 55 gallon drum with tap water, so with no food source. They were stored in a warehouse. Um, we, and and what, we, what happened is in three years, we shipped, they had no activity in three years. We shipped those organisms to Casa Grande, um, the biocatalyst. We put it inside of, of the bio, biological reactor. And within 24 hours, we saw biological activity and capability of, of, of reducing nitrate. So, when there isn't a food source, there might be some population loss that may take place. But in general, um, the organisms are, have this capability of going dormant um, and you're able to revive that. And we've got a process um, that we've worked on in, intensely to be able to get those organisms kind of up and going again um, when you have a long period of shutdowns. But if you have uh, an hour, or eight hours or, or even two weeks of shutdown, uh, we don't see any loss of activity. And as soon as you start feeding them with a food source or um, they essentially are able to revive themselves. Okay, so they revive themselves pretty much 100% after a, a couple of days or a few days or so. That's correct. Typically 24 to 48 hours after a very long down uh, shutdown period. And, and by long shutdown, I would say anything greater than three months. Wow. Okay, awesome. Um, now I'll get to the, uh, <clears throat> the question that Ray has. Um, he's asking if... Uh, this is an EPA approved treatment technology and, you know, could that be used on the, uh, on Indian country? Um, yeah, so, so this, this, the, the, the biocatalysts themselves have been NSF 61 certified. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what, what it seems uh, to take place is when it comes to drinking water, um, it's a, it, you've got to work with, on the, on a state level. So um, for example, it's been approved in the state of California. So, um, we can use it anywhere in the state of California. Um, it's, if it's a, in, 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 in Arizona, it'll be either ADEQ or Maricopa County that will dictate. Um, based off of the results that have been generated and, and some conversations, 
it seems like both ADQ and Maricopa County um, are very comfortable with the technology um, and would uh, would have no issues with um, uh, permitting it. And so uh, state to state is different. Um, there isn't like an EPA or a, a federal agency um, uh, that I'm aware of that that would say this technology can be can be um, used and then all the states kind of follow follow it. It seems like it's kind of a state to state um, type uh, decision that's made. All right, because yeah, because of the, of the fact that it's groundwater. Um, okay, um, does anybody else have um, any questions? If you have any questions, you can uh, type it in on the, the uh, question uh, box or there's also a chat box on your control panel. Um, in the meantime, um, I was just uh, kind of curious, so just out of curiosity, for that sunny slope, uh, how were they importing water to blend? I mean, what kind of amount of water were they importing? Was it through a pipe or were they actually uh, bringing truckloads or how, how, would, how were they doing it? Um, that's a good question. So um, they had a couple different options. Um, one was they were piped into a, a neighboring uh, water company um, where, so they could transfer water that way. Um, but in California, it's a little bit different than in the state of Arizona. Um, the water companies have water rights and certain allotments uh, that they could pump from various basins. So for example, you may, you may in, a, in a given year only able to pump from a basin, let's say a thousand ac acre feet of water. And so what happens is as soon as you wanna pump more water than that, you've gotta pay tier two pricing or replenishment pricing. And so um, you have your allotment, and, and so what Sunny Soap was doing is they were using up that allotment, and their next best option was to go up, above and beyond that and over pump from that basin and pay kind of almost three or four times the cost of, 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 of what they generally charge. So they had a couple of different options. For them, it made the most sense to just, just over pump from that basin um, that they, they had some allotment. Um, and so it was what they classified as, as replenishment water. So it wasn't being hauled on site. Um, uh, there is the larger water companies in California have access to like a met water, which is probably be similar to like a, a, a cap type water in Arizona. Um, and so it's kind of a ser several different tiers where, you know, the more water you pump, the, the more expensive it can become. Um, and so they wanted to stop over pumping or, or not have to import any more any more water into Sunny Slope. Oh, interesting. Um, uh, another question I had um, actually, um, Ray also just um, just wanted to uh, um, saying that for the Indian country, the EPA Region 11 is a regulatory agency. So just FYI, but I don't know about. Uh, I guess that would be for surface water treatment. Um, but um, anyways, I also had another question about, uh, you know, this is Arizona and, you know, California. We don't really see a lot of uh, low temperatures, at least here in the valley. But how do they perform in colder climates? Um, that's also a very good question. So temperature can have an impact, um, obviously, on, on biological processes. Um, we don't see this on the, obviously, in, in, in the southwest. There's some groundwater um, um, in the in the northeast that have colder temperatures. Um, as I mentioned, a lot even though this is on drinking water, um, a bigger kind of application for us is on the wastewater side, where you do see very low temperatures. Um, and uh, because we're able to select a specific organism for a specific process, if we know there's a cold water application, we're able to select an organism that operates um, uh, and well at lower temperatures. And so. Um, up to, I would say, unless you get down to less than 10 or 8 degrees Celsius, you'll still get some, some really good removal rates. As soon as you go less than 8 degrees Celsius for denitrification or the, at least a specific organism, you'll start to see um, a reduction in, in, in performance. And it, it's not like you'll lose entire treatment, but you may see a, a 20 or 30 percent um, impact on removal efficiencies. Um, and then once you go below five degrees Celsius, um, then you can also you, you get to a point where it's just too cold or it's freezing and you get very to little activity um, uh, from these organisms. OK, thank you, Ali. Um, another question is uh, by Ray. 
He's asking how is oxygen removed um, to make the water anoxic? Um, good question. So the organism actually, it's, it's through respiration. So um, the organism that's inside the biocatalyst will, um, it won't actually, um, when I dose it with a carbon source or the acetic acid, it takes that food source and the first thing that it'll do is, it'll, it's like it almost takes one part acetic acid and one part oxygen and it starts consuming that. And what happens is it'll, it'll do that until there's no more oxygen left. When there's no more oxygen left, it uses that acetic acid to then degrade nitrate. So it's the organism that um, removes the oxygen from the water. Um, it's, just, it's, a, it's a biological way of, of, of reducing oxygen. Right, so a little bit kind of the uh, noxic zone that you would find in uh, conventional wastewater treatment. That's correct. Okay. Um, let's see, any other questions? Um, I don't see anything popping up. Um, I do, um, how, I mean, do you have, so we were talking about nitrate and um, you may have um, mentioned that a little bit in your presentation, but if you could elaborate, do you have any other strains of bacteria that you use for other uh, contaminants um, that, uh, that you would like to highlight? Sure, um, so this specific organism that we use for nitrate removal it has the capability of doing nitrate, perchlorate, um, selenium, and uh, and chromium. So it has a, kind of a multifaceted uh, capability. Um, we've got a different organism where we look at VOCs, um, 1,4-dioxane, um, TCE, 1,2,3-TCP. Uh, so a lot of the VOCs, and that's, that's typically done under aerobic process. Um, and then on the wastewater side, uh, we focus a lot on BOD, COD reduction, ammonia, nitrate, and phosphorus. Okay, great, very interesting. Um, I don't see any other questions. And you know, um, so do you have any um, closing statement, Ali, that uh, you like to make? Uh, and then after that, we will probably take a short uh, five, 10 minute break before the next presentation. No, 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 uh, no, kind of, no closing remarks other than um, um, I appreciate everyone taking the time to listen to the presentation. Hopefully it's been interesting. Um, uh, as always, there's, there's um, a lot of times it, it, it takes time for people to digest the information that's presented, but feel free to reach out to Damien or myself um, and, um, and if you've got any further questions. Um, I would like to add that um, uh, Microbi is partnered with uh, West Tech. Um, Engineering. It's a um, uh, a large uh, um, uh, uh, technology and equipment um, uh, water and water water and wastewater treatment supplier um, in the United States, based out of Salt Lake City. Um, and so, Microbi's really role is um, is we continue our product development, our kind of our core competency of microbiology material science. Um, and Westec will be our delivery partner. So they will be the system integrators. Um, they will be delivering the processes. Um, and they will be a, essentially out in the marketplace uh, promoting the technology. So um, that's kind of, uh, uh, you'll see Microbi being presented through a couple different sales channels, uh, predominantly coming through the West Tech. Um, yes. So thanks again for your time. And if you've got any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to Damien or myself um, or anyone at, at, at West Tech. And actually, Ali, there's a couple more questions that just popped up. So if you don't mind to uh, stay with me a few more minutes. Um, one uh, question by Craig uh, Gorman was asking, is there any chance that the process can work in a brine matrix? Um, we haven't really tested on brine. The, 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 we've looked at high nitrate concentrations, um, looking at a couple thousand milligrams per liter on the industrial wastewater side. We're certainly interested in looking at, um, uh, looking at taking brine and removing, removing the nitrate. The key there is, is going to be, will that high TDS, because brine's got 70, 80,000 milligrams per liter of TDS. So when you look at salt water, you're maybe a couple thousand milligrams per liter, um, uh, whereas uh, the brine is pretty high. It's going to be interesting to see what impact that salinity has, both on the biological process, as well as the material that our biocatalysts are made of. So uh, my suggestion is if there's an application for that, um, if we can take a sample um, and, and test it in our, in our labs, uh, we would certainly be interested in doing a study. 
yeah, that would be a very interesting study to, to do. Um, then I have another question by Mike Russo. <clears throat> uh, the question is, do you, the biocatalyst require backwashing due to pressure head loss? No, so um, so we run our systems, uh, our reactors for nitrate are continuous third tank reactors. And if you might imagine, it's, um, it's a circular tank that's got an overhead mixer. The biocatalyst, we typically, if, you look, if you've got, a, let's say, a 10,000 uh, gallon tank, um, we typically only uh, use a 15 or 20 percent fill ratio. Um, uh, so you, water kind of comes in. There's, there's, and one of the advantages of a, of a continuous third tank reactor is there's no need for a backwash um, or forward, fa uh, forward wash or flushing of any kind. So you get very high water um, recovery rates. Um, and that was, um, we had tested looking at, at pack bed reactors and, and as well as at fluidized bed reactors. And one of the downsides of, of a pack bed reactor is you do see a differential pressure and, you, and you've got a backwash. Um, and, and then that backwash can be a significant amount and you may have to table that with um, a backwash recovery process. But the, the big advantage of a continuous stir tank reactor is it never needs to be backwashed. So both the system in Pasadena as well as the one in Casa Grande um, have never been backwashed or forward, forward washed or flushed or anything. Right, yeah, and it's uh, it really helps when you actually see it. I just remember seeing it at the uh, at the uh, Santiago Trail. It's actually just a tank just with a bunch of those little beads, those catalysts, and you can really see that there's no you know pressure head loss in the meantime, uh, and it it looks like it's very uh, pretty low maintenance, uh, which is a good thing. Um, is the another question by Ray is is the catalyst a fluidized bed or fixed bed? So we kind of uh, kind of answer that, but if you want to um, elaborate, uh, Ali, go ahead. Sure. So for nitrate, we use a continuous third tank reactor uh, where we have an overhead mixer. Um, but when we look at some other contaminants such as perchlorate um, or uh, where, you're, where you're trying to get to very low concentrations, um, we would use a pack bed or a fluidized bed reactor. And, and there are cases where um, and that's the nice thing about the technology is it could be used with a, a number of different reactor designs. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages um, to a pack bed versus fluidized bed versus a stir tank reactor. Um, and so it's very application dependent. But from a, from a technology perspective or a biocatalyst perspective, it has the capability of being used in each three of those reactor designs. Okay, very well. Thank you, Ali. Um, so, uh, if the audience has any other question, um, go ahead and type it now. Um, if I don't get anything, we'll probably just take a five-minute break. Um, just want to say, Ali, thank you very much for this great introduction of the Micro-V system. Uh, that was very interesting, and I just want to remind the audience that your presentation will be available on the AZ Water website in a couple of days. Probably we'll have the PDF version, and we will also have the um, it will be on a, a YouTube video, which will be accessible from YouTube and also, of course, from the um, AZ Water website. So, um, um, Ali, uh, oh, there's another question by uh, Regina. Why is it called a third tank reactor? Oh, um, uh, it's called a stir tank, not a third oh. tank. Um, <laughs> STIR. So it's just a, um, a continuous stirred tank reactor. So it just it just means that the reactor is being always continuously stirred. It's it's not um, a process where it, you stir it and you let it settle, or and you stir it and you let it settle. It's just always being stirred. Um, sorry if if it came off as third instead of stir. <laughs> <laughs> also, it's a good clarification. So and actually, I, I don't quite remember the mixer. Is it just a is it a pretty slow moving uh, mixer? I can't remember what type of mixer it is. Yeah. So the the media itself is um, the density is very similar to water. It's 1.05. It doesn't take much energy um, to move the, the media around. Um, we use a, um, it's kind of a, a, a hydrofolic impeller, um, and, um, and we typically run it anywhere from 40 to 60 RPM. So it's not something that's just moving at a very, very fast pace. It's, it's, it's a very slow mixer. And the purpose of the mixer is just to make sure that we get, you get adequate mixing and you're able to get kind of a homogenous mixing of the biocatalyst in the water. So you get 
good treatment efficiencies. Um, if you're able to make it to Pasadena or, or uh, out into Arizona, you'll see it's it's not something that's moving at a very fast pace. Right. Yeah. So, okay, I think uh, this was the last question. So um, I will pause the uh, the presentation for now, and then we'll uh, we'll pick it up again in about five minutes with the, uh, Doug Craver, who will be presenting uh, the uh, Adage technology, uh, which is um, called the Biota uh, system, another approach to the biological nitrate removal. Uh, again, thank you, Ali, and uh, we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. So stay tuned, and we'll, we'll get back on in about five minutes uh, with Doug Craver. Thank you.
Hello, everybody, again, and welcome back. Good afternoon. This is uh, it is now two o'clock, and uh, we will get ready for our second presentation, uh, which is uh, called "High Recovery Denitrification for Groundwater." The presenter is Doug Craver with Adage Water Technology. Doug joined Adage Water Water Technologies in March 2011 and he is the Western Regional Sales Manager covering 11 states. Doug is headquartered in Scottsdale, Arizona, and has been involved in the water and wastewater treatment industries for over 35 years in various capacities ranging from application engineering, system designs, sales and ownership of an international water treatment company. <clears throat> Technologies applied through his career include special filtration, reverse osmosis, seawater desalination, uh, ultra pure water, ultraviolet disinfection, ozonation, industrial wastewater, on site wastewater, municipal wastewater treatment, odor control, and pump systems. Doug has spent several years now for added helping pioneer the commercial development of the biota biological treatment systems for groundwater treatment of nitrates, perchlorates, and VOCs. Uh, before we start the presentation, before I uh, give it to Doug, I just want to remind you that you can all. Uh, chime in and uh, ask questions um, on your panel, and we will have a, uh, a, a short uh, question and uh, answer session at the end of this presentation. So now, uh, Doug, are you on? I'm here. Can you hear me? All right. Yes, I hear you fine. So let me turn on your screen, and I will leave the floor to you. And here you go. All right. There we go. All right. I hope everybody can see that okay. Yep. Um, yeah, be fine. Damien, do, do appreciate you uh, helping get this set up with the Arizona Water Association. And um, certainly we've seen a number of people down at that San Diego Trail site over the past month. And we appreciate everybody who has come down to take a look at the uh, pilots that have been ongoing there for about uh, 90 days now. As uh, Damien had mentioned, uh, my name is Doug Craver. I am the Western Region Sales Manager for Adage Water. Um, been in the water business for quite quite a number of years now, so um, had a pretty good overview of uh, everything from residential treatment through uh, desalination plants, and now I've been spending a lot of time with biological treatment. So today I'm going to kind of go through uh, a couple of different technologies for biological treatment, biota being the main one. So, uh, but first I'd like to give you just a little update on AdEdge Water Technologies. We were founded in 2002. We do have our headquarters in Duluth, Georgia with an office here in Phoenix, which uh, I work out of. Um, we work through manufacturer reps throughout the US, Canada, and South America. We got over 550 community water systems installed and that's probably a low number now. It may be closer to 650 by now. AdEdge was involved in, in all 12 stages of the US EPA arsenic demonstration projects. So we have a number of technologies for arsenic removal as well. Uh, we do have a manufacturing location in Duluth um, where all our systems are designed and manufactured in-house. Um, we also have customer service uh, as part of our company. Some of the common contaminants that uh, AdEdge has treated through the years is arsenic, iron and manganese, uranium, radium, uh, gross alpha, some heavy metals, nitrate perchlorate, ammonia, and TOC, which are being focused on with the biological treatment right now, fluorides, uh, turbidity, suspended solids, TDS, and VOCs. And VOCs are also targeted by the biological processes. Again, some core technology offerings. Again, it's just kind of an overview here of uh, some of the skid mounted type packages, but that's been the uh, staple of a lot of ad edge system, complete turnkey packages that can be integrated to the sites easily. Ollie went through quite a bit of information on the nitrates, so I'm just gonna briefly touch on this, but um, here's a kind of a map of the US, and again, kind of an overview of some of the nitrate issues around the country. It's obviously a, uh, there's a number of areas that have high nitrates and nitrate being acute contaminant, it is a very uh, targeted market by regulatory agencies and communities to make sure they bring those nitrates into compliance. So you can see we've got one little block, uh, block there in Arizona, which is in Maricopa County and is uh, you know, predominantly you know, probably due to uh, 
many of the dairies that were in the area for years and all the agriculture that's happened in the valley through the years. Um, one fact to note is that the, the use of nitrogen is not going down on crops these days. There are some other technologies obviously being used in, in, uh, in fertilizing crops and, and things to try to control nitrate better. But one of the facts of nitrate is once it's in the groundwater, if no nitrate was applied to the ground, um, for 75, it would take almost 75 years for that nitrate to potentially clear from the ground and through your groundwater. So this is not a, uh, this is not a situation that's going away anytime soon for the communities. And so again, what's the big deal with nitrate? It's basically, uh, again, a acute contaminant. It can get into the body, cause diuresis, um, could, could, you know, extreme the hemorrhaging of the spleen. Um, for children, what happens is, um, you know, their bodies, their metabolisms are different. And so as they take in the um, nitrate, it actually calls what's called blue baby syndrome, where they can actually start showing, um, you know, a change in their appearance due to the nitrogen that is starving the body of oxygen. So the technical name of that is methemoglobinemia, which is a mouthful there. Several processes are commonly used for nitrates, um, of which uh, the three most common we've listed here, anion exchange, uh, reverse osmosis, and then biological treatment. Um, RO is not used as often for nitrate unless there are multiple contaminants or a high TDS component as well. And due to the high um, amount of reject water that is generated from it, it is uh, you know, one of the more last choices for nitrate removal. So we'll I'm going to briefly touch on uh, anion exchange today, and then we're going to obviously spend most of the time on the biological treatment process. So with ion exchange, uh, basically there's um, you know resins that are used. They are there could be a standard anion resin that would be used. It's got a specific selectivity to it, and then there's nitrate selective resins. Um, because nitrate is lower concentration than sulfate, um, sulfate did, is a um, you know, can load into the resin before nitrate. So if you do have high sulfates in the water, then you typically go to this nitrate selective type resin, um, you know, to help increase the capacity. So, and again, you know, just kind of a little picture up there, these little round resin beads are, um, looks like a little plastic resin bead is what they are, but they're all negatively charged. And so when you regenerate it with brine, the chloride anion, um, because it's in high concentration, will drive the nitrate and sulfate off the resin and, and put chloride back onto the resin. And so then as the lower uh, dilution uh, well water will flows through there, the nitrate and sulfate um, then load back onto the resin, putting chloride back into the water. And that's the ion exchange that occurs for nitrate removal. Um, water quality, as in any treatment um, technology, is very important. And uh, again, two of the key items that, that we have to have for uh, ion exchange design would be nitrate and sulfate uh, because the sulfate does become a uh, competing ion on that resin for the, for the sites. So, and then in ion exchange design, you can have your standard co-current design, which is a downflow regeneration, downflow service, um, a pretty standard type system. Um, Countercurrent is another design that's commonly used. Um, there's, there's certainly some other variations, but these are the most common. And uh, in a countercurrent, you would do a downflow service, upflow regeneration. And doing the upflow type regeneration, you then minimize leakage of nitrate that comes out of the resin bed. So you get a little bit more consistent nitrate level coming out of an ion exchange unit. One of the challenges with ion exchange and blending is um, you will see a variable nitrate level coming out of it. Um, say after a regeneration cycle, you might end up at say two to three milligrams of nitrate. It'll slowly drop down to one to maybe half a part through the cycle, but then you'll see a slight climb at the end. So you do have some uh, more variability when you're doing blending with an ion exchange system, because typically you will blend a portion of that raw water around it, you know, and bring it back to a target range of maybe seven milligrams per liter of nitrogen, which would be 70% of the MCL. So treatment residuals, you end up with a um, high, high uh, TDS concentration in that 70 to 80,000 TDS range and very high nitrates. So um, again, this is a, a technology that's removing nitrate, but it's actually concentrating it and transferring it downstream for somebody else to deal with. So um, 
in California, this has been a big driving factor for uh, the biological treatment processes because of the um, inability to discharge brine to many of the, the prior locations, such as wastewater plants that are now trying to reclaim more water. And the high TDS and high nitrate um, does create challenges for those wastewater plants as they try to reclaim and recharge groundwater and or reuse that water for irrigation water. So your disposal options are typically has been a sanitary sewer if available. Um, you know, many, again, many um, wastewater plants are not willing to accept it any longer. Some are though. Um, Offsite management in California, they have what's called brine lines. And if you have a direct connect to the brine line, you might be paying a dime a gallon to discharge it. If you don't have a direct connect, that means you're gonna have to haul that uh, brine to the brine line. And you could be paying anywhere of 30 to 40 cents a gallon in some areas. So in California, when you start running operating costs for um, nitrate removal plants and you do a comparison between ion exchange and a biological plant um, like biota, um, you'll find that the, um, the salt hauling costs themselves for discharge can be um, two, uh, one to two times uh, the cost of just the operation of the ion exchange system for the salt usage and the, and the power and, and labor. Here was an example of one small uh, site that we did a cost analysis for. And what was interesting about this site is um, it's a small 80 gallon a minute system, uh, not a real high volume site, not a real high usage site, but um, it took about three years to get through the um, regulatory process, the funding process, permitting, and for the system to be installed. In that period of time, the wastewater plant that uh, before the drought started was gonna take the brine at a penny a gallon. Um, by the time the system went in, state of California was in a serious drought, wastewater plant would accept the brine, but they raised the price to 10 cents a gallon for this community. So that was a thousand fold increase in the, in the cost of discharging brine that occurred in a three year period. The uncertainty of the cost of uh, discharge of brine is again, one of the factors driving biological treatment in California and will ultimately drive it around the, uh, the rest of the United States. So that's a quick overview of ion exchange. Um, but today what we're gonna talk is biological treatment. Um, you know, just a general definition, biological treatment is a treatment process that uses naturally occurring microbial organisms for the degradation of different contaminants in drinking water. This uh, process has been used in wastewater for many, many years, but in the United States, it's a fairly new application for drinking water still. Um, but in Europe, it has been practiced for many years for removal of organics, ammonia, and nitrate from drinking water. So the United States is kind of gleaning some information from some of the history of use in, in the uh, European uh, communities and beginning to realize that this could be a very viable technology in the United States as well. So the technology that Adage is in the process of commercializing is uh, called Biota. It is a fixed bed, dual stage process. And uh, what we're gonna cover today is a little bit about the biota treatment process. We're gonna go through a, a number of graphs for performance results, uh, kind of just some general information on the plants that are available, and then kind of your next step if you, uh, as a community, want to evaluate this technology and potentially move to a full scale. The picture you see on the right-hand side of this is the Delano system up in California. This was the first permitted uh, biological treatment system in the United States for groundwater treatment and it's had an operating permit for a little over a year now and uh, has been putting water into distribution with uh, no issues, complaints, or uh, problems at this stage. So um, the state of California um, put up a, a significant uh, amount of grant money, you know, to help develop this site and to, uh, to help prove out this technology uh, in addition to about eight or nine other technologies that they have uh, actually funneled some grant money into to try to develop. So the, the interest in California for biological treatment is extremely high. And um, I would guess there's probably been 30 or $40 million put toward the testing of uh, some of these technologies. Uh, Biota, uh, though we have the first operating plant, uh, permitted plant out there. We also have a second one being installed and started up right now in Rialto, California. This is for uh, West Valley Water. It is a perchlorate, trichloroethylene, and a nitrate treatment uh, system. That is one of the unique advantages of the biota systems. It is uh, the way we culture the bacteria. It is uh, available to treat more than one contaminant. So 
you will see that in some of the subsequent graphs that we're going to show that you know it's a very robust treatment and it, and it can remove a number of different uh, contaminants beyond nitrate. This system is installed now. Um, it is either in startup acclimation mode or very close to be in there. So this system should be online uh, and operating in by early 2018 at the latest. So consider biota. Um, again, biota is a biologically tailored two-stage treatment approach. It's a fixed bed, dual-stage bio treatment system. This system will look very much like a lead lag carbon system if you're using that for VOC removal and or lead lag arsenic treatment system um, where you may have two eight foot diameter vessels or two 10 or two 12 foot diameter vessels being used in a lead lag arrangement. Um, we do have California, in California, they call it conditional approval, which requires piloting, but they have there's California approval for nitrates and perchlorates. And I understand that uh, VOC conditional approval may have uh, just been issued. Uh, I have not been able to 100% verify that, but I believe that's a correct statement. Um, we also have approvals in Minnesota and Illinois. Um, and in Illinois, a third full-scale system is under fabrication in our shop in Duluth, Georgia right now. Um, that will be shipped out in early 2018 and started up sometime in 2018. Um, so that will be a third full-scale system, uh, biota system that will be online um, most likely uh, by the end of 2018. The process does uh, create some backwash water, but it is uh, there's no brine involved and it's a non-hazardous waste stream. And so there are several uh, methods of uh, dealing with that backwash water, including a reclaim system. So, and it's also a very low energy type process. So again, some key system features. Um, it's a two-stage treatment process. So again, you're gonna have two pressure vessels there. Um, you know, it's a, uh, we take a slightly different approach on the bacteria. We utilize the natural bacteria in the groundwater. And um, then we will culture that, that those microorganisms. And because of, the, a number of different uh, bacteria that will grow that is helps contribute to the robust robust treatment and the number of contaminants we can actually uh, remove with the biota systems. Um, in the in the system we have nutrient additions and um, that we carefully control through uh, integration to instrumentation. We uh, convert all the nitrates to nitrogen gas and water we can actually run at very fast uh, flow rates through the system. If if any of you have arsenic treatment systems out there, you'll see this three to 10 minute EBCT. And uh, the flow rate through these is very similar to what you would see in a conventional uh, filtration system like that. Again, there's no hazardous discharge or waste to manage. Um, we do have to backwash periodically to control the biomass and for the hydraulics. Um, our system does come complete with a full set of monitors for DO which is dissolved oxygen, pH, temperature, nitrates, and turbidity. Uh, fully automated PLC control system with the ability to remote monitor. And um, you know, the final stage would be post-chlorination and disinfection. So again, a couple more of the advantages. We're utilizing common type pressure vessels. So uh, it's not gonna be anything proprietary there that you're gonna need to use for the treatment system. Again, we can use it for multiple contaminants. Um, with a single train. So um, that can actually uh, create a much smaller footprint for a site rather than having a uh, you know, treatment series of three or four different technologies in there to treat multiple contaminants. Um, we do eliminate that brine discharge and hazardous waste uh, decision associated with that. Um, we can recycle our backwash water. You know, again, uh, regulatory agencies are beginning to accept this pretty fast. Actually, the state of Arizona, ADEQ, because of the permitted systems in California, um, they're very objective in working with us on with clients that want to put in full-scale systems. So we believe that uh, regulatory approval in Arizona would be, um, you know, could be done, you know, on this technology at this stage. Here's an example of the backwash water that comes out of our, our uh, system. And so again, recoveries are typically in that 96, 97% range if you're not gonna reclaim any of the water. But if you do reclaim that water, you can get up to 99.9% uh, .9 of that uh, water use done. You will end up with a, some biosolids that will need to be managed at the end. 
And there's several methods of which those uh, could be managed, including filter presses, sludge drying beds, even just a sludge holding tank and having that hauled at some point, or actually discharged direct to a sanitary sewer. And as you can see, the TDS of the water being the same as the raw water, um, you have a little COD, TSS, and nitrate, but um, this is a very acceptable waste stream for a wastewater plant typically. Here just get, provides a little bit of an example of how long the biota technology has been around and being tested. Um, some of the first testing was done back in 1997, um, and that has expanded obviously to 2017. So, um, you know, there's a history of about 20 years there. You know, for the past 10 years, there's been a significant amount of piloting going on in California and testing going on there, which uh, of which you will see some uh, treatment performance graphs on a variety of these contaminants. As you can see, nitrate is predominantly yeah, been treated at most sites, but there are a number of other contaminants that have also been tested and treated with uh, the biota system. So here's just kind of a little rendition. Again, we're gonna have two pressure vessels. We're gonna, we're gonna use a granular media fil uh, filtration media inside there, which is uh, activated carbon. Um, so we will have um, basically take that activated carbon, again, add some nutrients, uh, we don't want to see chlorine in our system, though um, we will be testing chlorinated water through our system down at the San Diego Trail site. So uh, we, it'll be interesting to see how our system reacts to that. But ultimately what happens, you get the granular feed media, you get some nutrients in there, and then you end up with a fixed bed bioreactor um, that has bacteria growing within the carbon, and the bacteria then are used to break down the contaminants. So I'd mentioned the robust nature of the technology. Um, here's an example of some of the different bacteria that were isolated from some of the uh, pilot columns um, several years ago. Um, so as you can see, there's a number of different bacteria that actually begin to stratify and grow within the media beds. And because of uh, the variety of different bacteria, you know, some of these are gonna be nitrate reducing bacteria. Some of them may be more targeted toward chrom chromium reduction. Some may be targeted more toward the perchlorate reduction. But uh, you, you'd have a wide variety of these bacteria that are, are growing within these beds. And so this has helped contribute to that wide range of treatment that we see with the technology. And so again, we're gonna go back and use this word, contaminant destruction is the key benefit to this technology. Um, we are not concentrating contaminants. We are removing the contaminants and putting back to natural elements of CO2, nitrogen gas, maybe a chloride ion. Um, and chrome six gets reduced to chrome three. You know, again, in an ion exchange process, all these contaminants would ultimately concentrate in a brine solution that would have to be hauled away and or disposed of somewhere. So here's a, a quick little flow schematic of how, uh, how the simple works. And it's, a, again, a fairly simple system to operate. Um, you've got a well pump that's gonna be used as the driving force for the flow and the pressure going through the, the reactors. Um, as the well uh, transfers that water to the first reactor, we add nutrients. Uh, we also utilize acetic acid for an electron donor, but we also use, because we're culturing the natural bacteria in the, in the groundwater, we also use a little bit of phosphoric acid as a nutrient to get that, uh, the bacteria colonies to start culturing. Um, those are fed into the first uh, vessel, which we call the anoxic bioreactor. Um, the bacteria will again begin to consume all the dissolved oxygen, and then uh, once the dissolved oxygen is consumed, they do begin to break down the nitrates and or other contaminants and create an anoxic uh, reactor. Um, the water will then flow under pressure from the anoxic bioreactor. Um, we will then reoxygenate the water and we utilize a, a, a solution of hydrogen peroxide that will be dosed into uh, that stream. We also dose a small uh, amount of coagulant into that stream. What's gonna happen in the aerobic biofilter then, it will convert into an aerobic bed. You will get some final clarification uh, within this uh, filter. We also have a sand layer of silica sand in here that will be used for filtration. So the coagulant in conjunction with the sand layer um, will allow the water to come out of the aerobic biofilter, um, meeting the 0.3 NTU discharge standard that was established by the state of California for all the biological testing going on over there. And, um, you know, as previously noted, um, Arizona may be evaluating this a little bit differently, especially with the biota plant. We do not go to any atmospheric tanks. So um, in California, that 
that break of head on the well um, to atmosphere becomes uh, technically a, a surface water and so suddenly surface water guidelines had to, had to be in effect. The biota plant does never break head, it does not go to surface water. So, um, you know, this system is technically should be regulated as a groundwater treatment system and meet a lower discharge standard, but we will meet a 0.3 uh, NTU coming out of our aerobic biofilter for a, a very high percentage of the samples. So once the um, water leaves there, it goes downstream, it gets disinfected with chlorine, and then uh, some, uh, you'll get the log reduction with the chlorine in contact time. And in California, um, just simple chlorination in the contact time and in conjunction with a coagulant has allowed them to meet the uh, requirements for disinfection and allow this to be used you know, for potable drinking water. The system does require a backwash. Um, so, you know, some pressure differential will build in the reactors. Once that re differential reaches a certain point, which is typically 8 to 10 PSI, a backwash would be initiated. A backwash can come from a backwash tank and a backwash pump with non-chlorinated water, or we can actually take water from pressurized water from distribution that's chlorinated, dechlorinate it, and then use that for the backwash. Backwash water can then go to uh, either a sanitary sewer or it can go to a backwash reclaim tank to be uh, reused with some biosolids in for disposal. And so again, it's a two-stage plug flow biotreatment covering range of redox conditions. You'll see the uh, ORP go from negative to positive throughout the process here as you go from an anoxic to an aerobic environment. Um, we have a tailored integrated chemical feed control philosophy, so that way we carefully control the chemicals based on the contaminant loads. And um, that way we can um, get the most effective treatment out of there and control the biomass. And um, there is intellectual property rights and patents on this, but there are no proprietary components um, as part of the system. Um, if you do have some nut nutritional limitations, you can create some stress for the biofilters. And so this is something that we will monitor closely and the chemical feed systems are all um, have, have control built into them. So, uh, you know, if there were an acetic acid pump failure or something like that, we would know very quickly and the operator would be alerted so they could maintain that. Um, the key, you know, for effective operation is to keep a healthy bio, uh, bio keep some biofilm a healthy layer, but not too much, which causes the uh, uh, pressure differential buildup quicker in the, uh, in the vessels. And so here's another example of just some of the biofilm, you know, and on the left, you can kind of see there's a small amount of biofilm. It helps protect the bacteria. And um, whereas on the right, you can see a little bit larger masses in there, and those then begin to plug um, the activated carbon and plug some of the sites, creating a premature pressure uh, differential. You know, so again, you've got the protection, the adhesion there. On the right side, it starts causing head loss when you have too much, and you can actually have some clogging occur. And here's just kind of a picture from an electron microscope that kind of tries to give you an idea of a stress biomass on the left where you can see a big mass, um, some very small strings of bacteria, but it's not a very well defined. This would this would be an indication of a biomass that's grown on top maybe of the media and is beginning to cause extreme pressure loss through that media bed. On the right is more of a healthy biomass where you've got the proper nutrient dosage going in. And as you can see, the uh, the mass is much more defined, less defined. You've got, you know, more stringy colonies, things like that, you know. And so um, this would be an example of a more healthy type system that's getting new, proper nutrient feed. This is what we would expect to see in the biota plants, the way we control our nutrient dosage to the system. So that's a quick overview of the technology itself. What I'm going to do is spend some time now going through some graphs. Um, and some of the treatment, uh, different contaminants that have been treated with uh, the biota technology. Um, we have done this pilot for several months at Santiago Trail down at Casa Grande. We've unfortunately not been able to compile all the results from that yet, but we do have a few slides that I'll show at the beginning of the robust testing here that will uh, kind of show you some of the work that was actually done right down there at the Santiago Trail site. So here would be a, uh, a slide of what we call steady state conditions. Um, once the system is up and operating um, and gone through what we call an acclimation mode, 
uh, the acclimation is where we're basically setting up the anoxic environment and, and, the, and the reactors. And so once it uh, goes through acclimation, we go through steady state conditions. This is a synopsis of about uh, 14 or 15 days here, uh, maybe a few more than that actually. But as you can see, the nitrate level on the inlet is very consistent. The treated water nitrate is very low. Uh, during most of this pilot phase, the treated water nitrate coming out of our uh, biota system out of the second stage biofilter was in the 0.2 to 0.3 milligram per liter range as nitrogen. As part of the uh, pilot testing, we do shutdown tests on the um, systems. So we did a one day shutdown test, a two day shutdown test, and then we did a 10 day shutdown test. So in essence, there's no water flow going through the units, no nutrients being fed to the units. Um, and what this has done is to demonstrate that the bacteria don't die, they don't go away, they do go into hibernation mode, they sleep a little bit, but um, when they see the nutrients in the water again, um, as you can see on the right there on that 10, 23rd date, there is a little slight spike just above one milligram per liter. Um, from a time standpoint, this might have uh, covered maybe a two to three hour period. And within that two to three hour period, you can see the nitrate treated water results were right back down to that 0.2, 0.3 range. So very, very effective technology um, at pr producing a very consistent um, and low nitrate uh, treatment, um, you know, irregardless of shutdowns and things like that. Here's another uh, graph. It's a little bit busy looking. We get a, a significant number of data from our data logger. And so we're, we're dat logging data every 30 seconds. That's why it's just a little bit busy on this one. But uh, what you're gonna see is this is just, we're monitoring dissolved oxygen. Um, and ultimately the goal is to try to get the second stage dissolved oxygen back very close to the first stage dissolved oxygen. So your water is uh, almost the same type quality um, from the raw well water as it is after the treatment. You're gonna see a few little spikes on the DO first stage. These are typically due to backwash cycles. We do introduce some air in an air scour process during our backwash cycle. And so you will see some increase in um, oxygen in that uh, first stage anoxic reactor immediately after a backwash cycle. So you will see that spike, but it drops back down. And that's why there's a big blue line at the bottom there because there's virtually no dissolved oxygen in there for 99% of the cycle. And then finally, here's a little turbidity graph. And um, again, as you will see, there's, you know, again, it's a big blotch of blue there, and that's due to the number of um, samples that we get from our data logger. But um, I think what you'll see is predominantly, there's a big majority, a high majority of all the, the turbidity tests, much below 0.5 NTU. And many of them are, most of them online were reading in that 0.3, 0.4 range. Yet all the, most of the lab results were coming back 0.2 or 0.3. So um, we, we are effectively controlling turbidity without having to have any polishing filtration, UF or anything like that after the system. So those are the only graphs we ended up on Santiago Trail for, for this presentation, but I am gonna just quickly go through a few others just so you can see that um, as an example at the Santiago Trail site, we're only dealing with 7.4 parts of nitrogen there. So it's, you know, it's under the MCL already, but you know, here would be a slide, and, and some of these early day slides, you're gonna see a higher level of nit nitrate, it looks like, and these are as nit nitrate instead of nitrogen. So for, for most of you, you already know this, but the MCL is 10 milligram per liter nitrogen as nitrate, or 45 milligram per liter nitrate as nitrate. And that's a conversion factor that was used to bring it to calcium carbonate equivalents, which was a requirement for ion exchange calculations years ago. Um, with biological treatment becoming more popular now, more and more people are, are reporting this as nitrogen now. So anyway, these look a little unusual with a high level, but these are as nitrate. But if you look at that first graph, you're starting at 45, which would be 10. This got spiked all the way up to 70, which was you know, probably closer to 14, 15. And as you can see, the uh, treatment performance was very consistent down there. Um, intermittent backwashes are done. And as you can see, you know, the, the, after the backwashes, the nitrate performance maintains consistency. You never see any spikes. And in this case, that five number is about one, one milligram per liter is nitrogen. Um, in many of the tests, we do what's called an acetic acid failure test. Um, and this is just done to demonstrate that you do need the acetic acid and the nutrients being fed in for a proper operation. 
you know, we have certainly controls in place that if something were to happen with an acetic acid pump, um, the operator would be alerted immediately or very quickly based on nitrate readings uh, from monitors. And they would be able to go back there and see if they lost prime or something happened in one of the pumps. Here was a 24 hour shutdown test that was done at another site. This is the Delano site. Again, you can see there was uh, no appreciable gain in nitrate after the shutdown period. Um, we then went through a month shutdown period over there. And as you can see, uh, after a month shutdown, we did see a little bit of a spike of nitrate. But when you're looking at those numbers, it never spiked above uh, probably two and a half milligrams per liter as nitrogen. So it was still well below the MCL. And within you know a couple of days, it was already well down below the, the target goal of less than one milligram per liter of nitrogen. Another phase was done. Uh, part of the goal of biota is to, to bring the system down to the smaller systems. And as we know, with smaller systems, they don't operate continuously all the time. They do more cycle on and off. So here was another uh, series of tests that were done. And so again, 12 hours on, 12 hours off, um, no, no change in performance. Um, week on, week off, really no change in performance. There was an acetic acid pump failure in the middle of that test. Um, they actually lost prime on that. They went back out, reprimed it. And as you can see, the uh, treatment performance went right back down. You know, again, never did spike above four or five milligrams as nitrogen there. Here's a 33 minute on, 33 minute on test for 12 hours. So here's some more steady state NTU uh, results from the Delano, California plant. So you can see 97.8% of all the samples are below the 0.3 NTU. Disinfection, disinfection byproduct testing is done uh, through all the pilots. That was actually done this week at the San Diego Trail pilot. So we're waiting on the results for that now. But as you can see in, in uh, all testing, you know, the HAs, uh, THMs, all the DBPs, they're well below the MCL. These are some head loss observations. And again, we do build up some head loss in our unit. So we monitor pressure differential and we will initiate a backwash at the appropriate time. Um, typically on the bioreactor um, in full scale systems, we see anywhere from 24 to 40, 48 hour backwash cycles. On the biofilter, we see anywhere from 24 to 72 hour backwash cycles. Um, warmer water does create a little uh, more rapid bio growth, so you do have to backwash a little more often. So I'm gonna just jump quickly into a few other contaminants. Here's a perchlorate graph. Um, California, there's a number of sites in California that have nitrate perchlorate and a VOC in it. So, um, you know, perchlorate does have conditional approval. You can see as this perchlorate was ramped up, this was a uh, they were actually ramping it up by artificially injecting perchlorate in the water. As you can see, the performance was very consistent over that wide range of 100 to 900 uh, micrograms per liter. California has a MCL of six micrograms per liter for perchlorate. TCP removal. Here's another example. This is a new contaminant that's regulated in California at five part per trillion. And um, as you can see, the results were very favorable for TCP removal. All these VOC tests you're gonna see run were actually done with exhausted carbon. That was part of the protocol in California because as we all know, GAC will remove VOCs. Um, so we had to exhaust the carbon first so we could justify and prove that it was biological activity removing the VOCs. We just completed a pilot in California that had both all nitrate perchlorate and TCP in it and the system uh, removed all three contaminants very effectively. TCE is another contaminant that's uh, received a number of uh, quite a bit of testing. This will be, a, uh, I believe TCE is the VOC at the uh, West Valley water site. PCE removal, again, very effective removal. Chrome 6, um, again, demonstrated very favorably. California had established a Chrome 6 standard. They have now um, pulled that back for a couple of years as they evaluate more technologies um, of, we, of which Biota will become uh, a technology they probably will evaluate closer. So here's just a real, real quick graph or a little uh, kind of rendition showing you, say if you've got uh, well contaminated with VOCs, nitrate perchlorate and Chrome 6, and I didn't want to stay there. Um, as you can see, you would have a multiple of treatment trains up on top, whereas below you could treat all that with um, one biota system with two vessels, um, again, depending on flow. 
the biota plants are set up as package plants or standardized type plants with eight foot diameter, 10 and 12 foot diameter vessels. As the flow increases, we just package more what we call trains of these. So you might start with a biota 12-1 train, which is two 12 foot diameter vessels. 12-2 becomes four, 12-3 becomes six. So uh, we just start multiplying and adding more vessels together. Here's kind of just a rough rendition example of a plant layout. This would be maybe a 3MGD plant. Uh, again, we're not gonna treat the full 3MGD, we'll treat a portion and blend a portion. This would be an example of a four, uh, two train system with four vessels. So you're gonna have two anoxic reactors, two uh, aerobic biofilters here. Um, the little red skid up there is your chemical feed skid. We've then got a instrumentation skid, got a little blower package up here. Um, and a little office over here, maybe a little laboratory set up with some of the instrumentation. So it uh, can be, be uh, done in a very tight footprint compared to some of the other technologies since we're not going into atmospheric tanks. We don't have mixing tanks, things like that. It's all being done under pressure. And so again, there's a little bit of a kind of a rendition of a uh, one train system and the simplicity of some of the piping on it. So it'd be an example of one of the pump skids or the chemical feed packages that we provide. And again, each community may have their own specific design for chemical feed and uh, you know, containment. Here would be an example of an instrumentation panel. This would include the nitrate monitors, DO, you know, pH, ORP, the whole works. This would be an example of maybe what you'd see on your PLC screen. You would get a complete PLC and a monitor station with this um, rather than just a little HMI screen. So again, some likely applications, uh, areas where you have no discharge available for brine or you're gonna pay high uh, cost to haul brine, um, sites where you have high utilization rates, and again, where you're gonna, that would create a lot of brine generation and or um, a lot of salt usage. Um, we're typically targeting wells, and maybe 250 gallons a minute, but really targeting them more in that 300 uh, GPM range and above. And you know the goal is to, uh, to design smaller systems for lower flows. We are looking at some groundwater remediation applications. So, th so that is another outside uh, market we're looking at. Drinking water and groundwater treatment is the primary market right now. So by contaminant, our target is nitrate. Um, if it's you know standalone, it can still be a very effective technology as you add some perchlorate in, maybe some BOCs in. Um, you, you now begin to look very attractive as a single standalone technology for multiple contaminants. So we do have pilot systems operating. Um, this is one of our pilots. Uh, we do have a system just wrapping up the pilot down at San Diego Trail right now. Um, so these are skid mounted little packages that simulate the full scale system. They've got all the instrumentation on it, chemical feed, you know, everything, virtually everything you get in that full scale plant is on our small pilot. And then this is just a rough timeline we've developed um, at, going over through the last three or four years. We know it's gonna take some time to get through piloting, regulatory, et cetera. So once a, once a client decides they wanna maybe pilot this technology and move forward and, and get a full-scale system in someday, we look at almost a nine month period before we're gonna be able to get to that full-scale contract. Certainly some areas are gonna go quicker, but um, you know, we, this is kind of a, a guideline that we've seen through time, so. And in general, that's what I'm gonna to touch on the biota today. I know uh, probably running a little short on time here. We do have another technology called pneumonia that we use for ammonia and um, iron manganese reduction. But I think before I jump into that, I think maybe we'll open this up, Damien, for questions. Uh, yeah, I don't, um, so folks, if you guys have any questions, please uh, type them up in the uh, questions uh, uh, tab over on, the, uh, on, on your control panel. Um, I don't really see any questions right now, but uh, one that I had um, was about the uh, the stratification. Um, how long does that take to actually stratify? That, that was a pretty interesting slide showing all the types of bacteria that you had. Um, and uh, yeah. how, how I don't long know does that usually? I, I don't know if I can give you an exact time frame for the full stratification like that, but what I can tell you is the acclimation periods for our systems will range from two days to a week to two weeks, depending on water temperature. We've actually done uh, testing and piloting in Minnesota on 45 degree water. 
and you know the system worked very effectively there but it did take longer to acclimate maybe up to two weeks there versus the arizona water site down at san diego trail the water there was extremely warm we were uh, dealing with water temperatures up to 93 degrees coming into our pilot system and so we actually acclimated the system down there in about two days wow so Dude. um so Good certainly idea. that stratification is going to occur somewhere you know after that uh, acclimation periods uh, begun yeah, it looks like they do really do like the heat, so that's it's good. That that's an surely an advantage here in Arizona. Yeah, this wow. was this was a, actually a bit of a challenge down here at the San Diego Trail site. Right. I believe this is the warmest water temperature we've ever seen for a pilot, and part of it is the well was already uh, got some warm water coming out of it, but they also had some you know lines they had to run over to our pilot um, <laughs> systems, and so the 110 and 115 degree heat this summer. Uh, Definitely helped elevated that water a little bit more temperature that water to us. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Um, and then you know, <clears throat> talk, still talking about the stratification and the uh, you know the biology. How often? I mean, how does the uh, backwash uh, frequency, I guess, impact the, uh, the that stratification or uh, that biology? Does does it have any impact on you know how many times you you backwash? Uh, again, on the stratification part, I can't tell you uh, if it would disrupt that stratification at all. Um, but what I can tell you, the backwash is integral to break up some some uh, biomass that does begin to develop, and, and so we monitor that very carefully with pressure differential. The top, probably 12 12 inches uh, of the bed, does a big majority of the work for the nitrate reduction. But you will see nitrate reduction through that full bed. So uh, when we do that backwash, we do that air scour. And you can you can see you know um, some of that uh, material actually being broken and floating in that water as we go into from the air air scour phase to the water portion of the backwash. Okay, thank you. Um, also, um, you know, for the uh, the different chemicals that you feed, I know you feed um, H two O two and a, a coagulant. So for the H two O two, is it a, a solute? Is it a solution? And and if so, is it what what concentration do you use for that? Um, for peroxide, um, typically you're going to use 34% or lower in concentration. So really the, the stuff that we see available out there that's uh, got the NSF approval on it ranges from 27 to 34%. At 35%, you end up with some um, storage and handling issues. And so um, we will maintain that concentration below 35%. So 34 would be standard. Um, similar for acetic acid, you can buy this in very highly concentrated forms but we would typically use a 56% solution, um, you know, because that uh, enables uh, easy storage and safe storage of the chemical. You know, bulk chemical storage tanks will be required for storage of both peroxide and the acetic acid. And to uh, get the best cost for those products, you're gonna wanna take, uh, be able to take full loads of about 5,200 gallons per load. Okay, yeah. Makes sense. Um, and, you know, uh, talking about the acetic acid, does it have any impact on the pH of the water? Do you need to do any pH adjustment on the back end? Um, that's a very good question. Um, a combination of the acetic acid and the phosphoric acid may reduce pH slightly. Um, alkalinity of the water does, does play a big factor in that. Um, we kind of look at a target of about 80 milligrams per liter of alkalinity. Below that, you will, you will see some pH reduction combination from the two chemicals, but also from CO2 conversion as you go through the process. Um, higher alkalinity waters, you typically uh, do not see as much pH correction. The other thing to keep in mind is we are typically treating, you know, as an example, maybe 50% of the flow blending 50 or maybe treating 40 and blending 60. So uh, the raw water does get blended back in at the end. Um, in some cases, a client or a community may require um, sodium hydroxide to be added, you know, to raise pH back up to the inlet pH. In other cases, the the volume of blend and the water quality itself may dictate that that's not required. So each site would be specific based on that uh, raw water quality coming in. Okay, thank you. Um, now I actually have a question from Ray Pulver. Uh, he's asking, does the carbon bed see degradation and replacement of media? Um, there will be some slight replacement required through the course of the year, um, but it's typically, it's not a full media bed replacement like you would see with one of your arsenic systems or something like that. 
what happens is during the backwash cycle, you may lose a little bit of carbon, you know, through time through that backwash cycle. Some of it may break down a little bit. So, you know, on a routine basis, maybe every three, six months, a year, you know, once you get your full scale system operating, you would establish that frequency. You may have to make up a little bit of uh, carbon into the top of that vessel. But um, it's not like you're going to do a 100% replacement like you would with some medias okay. and some technologies. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and so I don't see any other questions. Uh, but um, I just wanted to ask this, you know, about see all those controls. Um, are the oper if there's a uh, power outage, um, is there any way for the operators to operate this manually or does it get a little challenging? Um, well, we would assume if there's a power outage, there would hopefully be a, a battery backup in the controls to allow this to keep running and maybe a backup generator for the plant. But um, if power goes out and the well goes out, certainly we cannot keep our system running. Um, but there are ways to manually override our system if for some reason the automated controls, you know, if there was something going on with the automation or the control portion of it like that, you know, we could switch this into an automated mode. We have a, a screen that is developed where you can go into each individual phase. You can activate backwash cycles when you want to. You know, you can activate chemical feed pumps. You can change the outputs. So um, there's a, not, a lot of this can be done both manually and um, automatically. But the key is if you lose power to site, if you don't have a backup generator there, you're yes. not going to have a well running. You're not going to be able to run our system. That, yep, yeah, that's true. That's true. And you know, talking about controls, so do you have um, remote control uh, capability as far as you know, uh, through a uh, like a wireless data connection, so somebody can operate it from afar? Yes. Um, as part of our full scale systems, we actually offer a service contract for the first year. That's built into the price of the systems. Um, we'll do quarterly visits uh, to work with operators and work with them but as part of that we would be able to remote monitor and help them operate that system um in saying that with a lot of the hacking going on in the world today many it departments uh, for communities are a bit hesitant to allow a third-party company like ad edge to be able to log in right. remotely to something like that so again yes we can do that um, yes, it's also site specific and what that community or that um, company operating that system would allow. We would certainly prefer to have access to our system to be able to help through that period, you know, uh, through the operation period and to help support it. But we also recognize um, the security concerns from uh, municipalities as well. Yeah, that's true. That comes up uh, a lot usually with the IT department as uh, certainly a concern. Um, I see we don't have any more questions and we have about uh, another maybe five minutes. So um, if you want to uh, talk about the pneumonia, uh, Dave, you're more than welcome to. All right, I will, I will do that. Um, so ammonia, the untold story. Ammonia, as many of us know, is not a regulated contaminant, but it does contribute um, to THM formation and to some other contaminant formation. So um, in some areas in the Midwest, ammonia is very high, and so they do have to evaluate treating ammonia um, instead of just nitrates. In Arizona, I don't see as many ammonia issues, but this technology can also be used to remove iron, manganese, and potentially arsenic in conjunction um, you know, with the iron and manganese. So uh, there's, there's some very intriguing uh, potential with this technology as well um, beyond just ammonia. So again, real quickly, ammonia is a colorless gas comprised from hydrogen and nitrogen, and um, it, it is naturally occurring, but it can also be uh, formed, you know, going through the um, you know, process, say, in a water plant or groundwater where you do have nitrates present. So ammonia groundwater, again, naturally occurring. Typically, it's below 0.2 milligram per liter. Um, it gets in, uh, influenced by agricultural work runoff, uh, you know, feedlots, manure, things like that from dairies, industry, a disinfection with chloramines, um, some pollution, food leftovers. So there's a few few areas you can pick up some ammonia. Um, when you look at this, as, again, you'll see a huge predominance of ammonia out the Midwest out there. So this technology is being um, tested and some full-scale systems being installed out in the Midwest. 
This technology was uh, licensed by Adage from the Environmental Protection Agency. This, this, this technology was developed by them. And to commercialize it, they needed a company like Adage to license that technology. So we have licensed that. We actually won a technology transfer award for this technology, taking it from the public sector to the private sector this year. So this is another new, exciting biological technology that we will be developing. It'll be becoming more prominent as the year goes on, as the years go on. So why is uh, ammonia a concern? You do have high chlorine demand requirements when you have ammonia. You do risk DBP contamination, uh, TOC, and when you add the residual chlorine, you can get nitrification in the distribution system back to nitrites. Um, you could, can create some taste and odor complaints as well as corrosion. Um, it does interfere with the treatments that require oxidation, such as arsenic, iron, and manganese. Um, though in conjunction with pneumonia, because we are aerating the water, that's where the arsenic and iron and manganese do also come out in the, in the system. It is harmful marine life and it does can biologically foul filters. So some common treatment approaches for ammonia have been blending, breakpoint chlorination, ion exchange, RO has been used uh, periodically, induced some air stripping and then biological. And biological is what is what we're promoting with the pneumonia system. So again, here's just a little table that covered that again. Um, what you'll see down there with biological, those you can remove the iron, manganese, and arsenic with it as well, where the other technologies would be more specific uh, toward the ammonia. So this would be an example of a pneumonia system where you are taking the groundwater. Uh, pumping it into an atmospheric tank where it goes through extensive aeration in this tank. Um, and then it will be polished by a uh, filter. So it could be an oxidation filtration filter, um, could be just a big multimedia type filter. But again, so in this case, we do have a repressurization pump that we need to repressurize that water, you know, from that first stage uh, atmospheric tank. And so again, here's just kind of an example of, um, we do feed a little bit of nutrient in there, so a little phosphoric acid. Um, we have a little blower as part of the aeration. It goes into the aerobic contractor, contactor. It then goes into the media biofilter. Downstream of the biofilter, it goes through a disinfection step, and then that water will flow out to distribution. And here is again, just another rendition of, you know, uh, how a pneumonia system may compare to a more conventional treatment system where you may have to have both an oxidation filtration and an ion exchange system to take care of a couple different contaminants. So a couple of the advantages of the biological approach for ammonia, no extensive use of chemicals, easier to achieve uh, the chlorine residual with it. No concern about uh, formation of DBPs. It's a single treatment unit for multiple contaminants again. Very simple operation, low backwash frequencies, high water recoveries. Again, there's no concentrated wastewater brine or sludge to manage. And uh, flexible design does uh, uh, now uh, enable integration to uh, systems. And again, we do have pilots available for uh, pneumonia systems. So here's a couple example of some of our pilots. Um, you know, and again, pilots can range anywhere from two to three months um, once you get them started and acclimated to uh, final. Uh, reports being written and provided. So a couple of just quick questions that we commonly get. What is the highest level of ammonia that you can treat? And it would be up to 10 milligrams per liter, obviously, because we can convert that over to nitrate. Um, obviously, you wouldn't probably treat it if you had 10 milligrams because you would then be at the MCL for nitrate. But, you know, there is a potential to go up that high. Substrate is uh, in the biological contractor is a gravel. And um, the same thing is that's what we use in the biofilter as well. Uh, the polishing filter may have some oxidation media in it, depending on what uh, what other contaminant maybe we were uh, treating in that water. Acclimation period: 30 to 45 days. Um, that is, I have not been as directly involved with this. Uh, that does seem like a long period, but once it's converted, uh, acclimated, it just continually operates after that uh, period. Since you're dealing with a, a contaminant that's maybe not regulated, that water can be going through this acclimation period and be used uh, possibly during that period. You will have some backwash water to discharge. You could add the contractor to an existing filtration system. So if you already have a filter, you could add this up front to enhance the uh, process for the ammonia reduction. 
and then we do include some monitoring uh, systems for nitrite, DO, and ammonia in there. And so that's just a quick overview because I know we're about out of our time. This is a technology that is available through Adage as well for biological treatment of groundwater. And uh, certainly if you have any uh, opportunities for something like that out here, we would be happy to come and uh, visit with you and go through this in a little bit more detail. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Doug. Thank you so much for this uh, great introduction to the uh, biota system and that uh, brief introduction to the pneumonia uh, system. Really appreciate it. And uh, looks like we have uh, run out of time. I don't see any questions, so I'm just going to go on to the closing statement. Um, let me just switch to... You can get rid of my minions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Although it's quite uh, entertaining, so maybe I'm just going to leave it there. But uh, yeah. uh, I'd like to thank our two presenters, Ali Dory and uh, Doc Craver, for introducing us to these new technologies. Uh, with sustainability becoming more and more important every day, I'm sure that we will see more and more of these systems in the future. I think this it looks like this is uh, where the future is going. Um, in a couple of days, you will be able to find these presentations in PDF forms on the AZ Water website. Please visit, please visit the AZ Water Association Water Treatment Committee's webpage for that. And you will also see in a couple of days a, the, uh, the video recording on the AZ Water YouTube channel. If you have additional questions about these presentations, you may contact the presenters after the webinar. The presenters' contact information will be contained in their presentation. A PDH certificate for this webinar will be emailed to you after the webinar as a PDF file. Please send me an email if you do not receive by tomorrow morning. I'll do my best to uh, email them tonight. The AZ Water Association has many interesting events planned for the future. Many of these events are free, and some of the events, such as a plant tour or workshop, may include a free breakfast or lunch. Please visit the AZ Water Association's website and check out the event calendar for details about these events. There's a, a, a lot of stuff happening over there. If you have not joined the AZ Water Association, please consider joining. It is not very expensive to join, and the association offers many benefits to water and wastewater industry professionals. The website for the AZ Water Association is www.azwater.org. The AZ Water Association is always looking for interesting topics and presenters for a webinar of interest to water and wastewater industry professionals. If you would like to present or sponsor a webinar, please contact the AZ Water Association Water Treatment Committee. In closing, I would like to thank again Alidori and, uh, of Micro-V Technologies and Doc Craver of AdEdge uh, for presenting their very promising processes. Thank you for everybody for attending, and I hope you found it interesting. Have a great rest of your days. Bye-bye.